Now what I care about is finding out like what's true because I'm like, this stuff is real. Like they're telling me true things. Like what if this is what I'm called to do myself? Cause they're telling me things like, hey, and you're you're called to be a warlock and this is your ancestors and, 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 and your great grandmother was a witch. And, and they tell you all these things just to like, to get you to believe this cause they want, the devil wants to use you. And I decided, hey, I'm going to go to the beach and I'm going to, I'm going to call upon whoever the higher power is. And I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know anything. I went out there profusely crying, just screaming, who are? Are you what's the purpose of life who are you what's the purpose of all this i need to know when i'm screaming and i heard a voice say i'm gonna show you now i got literally knocked down to the ground like it was it was too strong like i just i couldn't like i just got i got I curled up in a ball and i was manifesting demons i was crying profusely coughing up i felt like things were coming out of me it was my my spirit and my soul i just knew it's jesus well, Richard, it is an honor to have you on the channel today. For the people who maybe don't know you, who've never seen you, could you just introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about who you are? Amen. Again, thank you for having me on the channel, Eric. I just want to honor uh, De La Fe. It's an honor to be on here and just and, and be able to bless the body of Christ and those that are unbelievers too. Um, so my name is uh, Richard Lorenzo Jr. I'm a pastor out here in um, Central Florida at the Remnant Revival Outreach Center. I have a beautiful wife three kids. Um, uh, I, I, uh, I'm a leader of a ministry. Um, and yeah, I'm, I'm Puerto Rican descent. I come from a city um, down south, uh, Broward County, Florida, near Fort Lauderdale. Um, and yeah. Richard, can you tell us about your life before Jesus, starting with your childhood? So again, I was, I was born and raised in um, Fort Lauderdale, um, Broward County, Florida. I was born premature at five months. Um, I almost died. Um, they actually had to um, put me in an incubator for a few weeks. Um, my mom couldn't see me for the first two weeks until I developed enough to be able to come out of the incubator. Um, that was the beginning of my life in it. I continued to grow up in a, um, a Puerto Rican household. Um, my parents are from uh, two cities in Puerto Rico, Caguas and Lutuado. My mom, Catholic, my dad was raised Christian, but really wasn't um, in the faith, really, really lukewarm. I wouldn't even say lukewarm, just not in the faith at all. So I was raised in a home where, um, you know, a lot of love. Um, my parents did, you know, Puerto Rican traditional, a lot of love, cared about us, um, took care of us. We, we weren't raised in a wealthy home, but we, we also weren't raised in a super poor home. It was, I would say, about middle class. And my family, um, my mom, my dad always wanted the best for me. So I, I, I would go to church, Catholic church, CCD, got my confirmation, reconciliation, that's what they call it, and um, communion and the whole nine baptized as a baby. Um, but never really believed in the Catholic religion, just would go because my mom wanted me to go. And, you know, being raised in that household, there was a lot of, um, there was a lot of issues, um, because obviously Christ wasn't the center fully. So, you know, a lot of tribulation throughout my lifetime, um, a lot of rejection growing up, you know, seeing things and experiencing things. But again, my parents, I honor them. They loved me, my, me and my brother. I have one younger brother who's 29 now. He's a few years younger than me, four years younger than me. Um, we, we were just raised in a household where, you know, there was a lot of uh, rejection. Just when Christ is not the center, is there's going to be issues. There's going to be issues just because Jesus, Jesus needs to be the center of everything. So, you know, being raised in Broward County, there's a lot of violence. There's a lot. I was a product of my environment, um, trying to live two lives. So, you know, trying to please my mom. I love my mom so much. You know, getting good grades in school by any means necessary, cheating on my tests, just doing whatever I could. And I wasn't a dumb kid. I, would, I was smart as well. So I was able to kind of manipulate the system, finesse. Mm -hmm. And if you know about Florida school system, it's very, it's terrible. So it was really easy to cheat and get, a, and get past things in Florida. You know, I'm talking about honors classes, AP classes. And but at the same time, I lived a whole nother lifestyle. I played on the basketball team in my school and I loved basketball, but I also loved women. I loved partying. I loved drinking. I loved smoking and I loved robbing and doing all types of crazy stuff. Anything that could give me a thrill. It wasn't because I needed money. It wasn't because, um, because I, I, I was so poor that I needed to go do this. It was because I wanted to, um, I wanted acceptance from my peers. So again, a product of my environment, you know, if you do these type of things, you're accepted and you're looked higher. You know, they, they look at you like you're like you're more of a man. So, you know, if you have, if you have a girlfriend, you're a sucker. You know where I'm from. You need to have multiple girls. If if you're not robbing and smoking and drinking, if you're not getting money and tra selling drugs, you're, you're nobody and no one looks at you. So these are the things that I, I did to be accepted and at the same time maintaining a certain GPA because I, I did want to go to college. I did want to eventually leave um, Broward because I knew 
that Broward just had, it was just, it was sucking me dry. Um, so I left Broward at 18 and I went to Orlando and I got accepted to UCF, the University of Central Florida. And I went there and you think things would change, it didn't. Um, you know, my first two years, it got worse, drinking more. Now I brought that lifestyle to Orlando around a bunch of, you know, kids that, um, that, that, that didn't know that lifestyle. So now I took advantage of it, drug dealing, making money, um, partying, fraternities. I wasn't part of one, but I'd be involved and affiliated with all of them, getting into the clubs, you know, $2 Long Islands, you know, pictures of Long Islands in the, in the club and, you know, always drunk. Drinking and driving was a normal thing since, since the age of 17. Mm. Drinking and driving was normal. I'm talking about obliterated, drunk driving, and I, I always made it home. I always seemed to to get away with things, and my friends knew that growing up. All my friends growing up would get arrested, in and out of jail, going to prison, I mean, shot at, all types of stuff, uh, crazy things. I mean, I had friends that even were killed and died, but I never got caught. I never got shot at. I never got, obviously, I'm alive, never got killed, never got hurt. It was uh, There was some type of grace on my life, and I didn't know that um, back then I thought I was just lucky. I saw, I just saw, you know, I'm just lucky. And the, the lifestyle continued and it never, it never stopped. It always got worse. So now I'm at UCF, barely made it through my first year, maintained the 2.0, and then eventually started taking Adderall. Um, once I got introduced to Adderall and mixing that with alcohol, I became addicted. And now I'm, um, I'm smoking weed. I'm drink, I'm drinking alcohol four to five days a week, minimum, partying all the time, and then taking Adderall to pass tests, midterms and finals. Um, that lifestyle just kept, it kept building up, you know, hitting the gym whenever I could, waking up at five o'clock in the afternoon to go to the gym, go drink again. And it was just a lifestyle. Um, and then I eventually I was like, you know what? I want to change scenery again. I was with this girl and we were going through a lot of issues. I'm talking about um, all types of abuse, man, on both ways, just a lot of um, chaos. And because I was in fornication, obviously, I didn't know Christ at all. Um, and this is actually the first time I experienced sleep paralysis twice, actually. I was in my apartment at UCF and um, I actually experienced um, a, a demon. At the time, I wasn't sure what it was, you know, knocking on my closet door and I was sleeping, but I was awake and it scared me. I had so much fear, but that's when, you know, I realized, okay, there's something spiritual going on. When I woke up, I was kind of nervous, but I was like, whatever. Now, the second time was before I left to New York because now me and my best friend at the time, we wanted to change scenery. So we said, you know what, we're going to get a U-Haul, pack up all our stuff, and we're going to go move to New York at the age of 20 years old. I'm talking about like living in the U-Haul until we find an apartment. We had nothing lined up. They wouldn't accept us because we had no credit at the time. And we just went in faith, um, even though back then I didn't even know what faith meant. I was in my ex-girlfriend's apartment before I, I left to New York. And this is like the first time I had a, a spiritual encounter that woke me up. A demon, an actual demon, and I knew it was this time, was trying to like enter me. Um, I was stuck. I was paralyzed. I couldn't move in my bed. It was about 10 a.m. And I know it was 10 a.m. because there was a it, the light was out. It was she had no um, she had no blinders because she had just moved in that apartment, and I couldn't move. And I could see everything in the room. My peripherals expanded. It was like my spiritual senses were heightened, and I could see everything in the room, even in the bathroom. And I'm stuck and I'm scared out of my mind because I can't move. And a demon was coming from the left of me to try to enter me, laughing at me, literally laughing like, "Haha, I got you now." And it, and it wasn't audible speaking. It was like more like it was like mind. It was in my mind. It was telepathic, I guess you could say. Hmm. And um, and I was speaking to this like I was like, "No, no, no." I was like, "No, no." And it was just like, "I got you. It's over." And all I could do at the time, because I'm, I'm tears are still coming down my eyes. I can't move. As I started pr praying the Lord's, the Lord's prayer. Um, you know, in the Catholic Church, they make you recite these things. And that's that's what I, all I knew. So I started saying in my head, "Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name." That like, you know, because I was scared out of my mind. And the minute I started praying that prayer, as an unbelieving Catholic, alcoholic, drug addicted, terrible person, a light came, boom, and that demon literally got mad and left. Mm -hmm. And I remember having a conversation with this light for about twenty minutes about how I need to change my life, how you need to stop that the consequences of the things that I'm doing, the things that I'm doing, there's consequences and that's why these things are happening. And then I remember I, I went back to sleep and woke up weeping, crying, telling, you know, my, my ex, like, did you, did you not see what just happened? She's like, what? I was sleeping. Like, you didn't, you, you didn't, and you know, and I'm freaking out and I'm like, did you do this to me? I'm like, cause you were to the left of me and I'm thinking all this crazy stuff. And I just was like, I gotta get out of here. I gotta go to New York. And again, you think it would stop, it didn't. Went to New York. Now I'm in New York City bouncing in clubs. I'm living in Washington Heights, New York. I went from Brooklyn to Washington Heights. If you know where that's at, I went from Crown Heights to Washington Heights. That's from the hood to the hood. I'm living out there at 20, 20 years old, about to be 21. I got my security license and started bouncing at clubs. So now I'm bouncing at clubs in New York City, downtown Manhattan. I mean, 
I'm drinking. I'm drinking. Now it's 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 a different lifestyle. Now I'm meeting new people. Now I'm still selling drugs. I'm still robbing. I'm still finessing. I'm robbing anything I could do to get that, that adrenaline, that rush to rob, I would do. I'm talking about clothing stores, designer stores, and I was good at it. I had I had I had this the strategy. I had demons in me. They, it's it's terrible. I think about it now and it literally like I just give, I cry a lot at home. I cry in prayer because the, of the grace that God had in my life. I'm supposed to be in prison. Credit card scamming. I mean, everything you could think of. Anything to do something bad to get to get over the system. And um, I'm out there and I started getting real depressed. And that's the first time I got suicidal. I was suicidal. And I'll never forget. I cut off everybody in my life because I was so depressed. I just thought it was, I thought it was my best friend. I thought it was my ex. I thought it was this person that had so much paranoia. I had so much chaos. I just cut everybody off and isolated myself. And that's the first time I contemplated suicide. I remember I was in my apartment and I thought about it like I felt so much depression. I said, you know what? It's better to just die than be like this. I was depressed, like I said, and out of nowhere, I heard Richard. I heard a voice literally say Richard, and it brought so much life to my, like, to my spirit, like to my soul. It brought so much joy. And I freaked out, like, who was that at the time? Because I didn't know Christ. I thought it was my dead uncle. So I'm like, that was my dead uncle. It had to be like, oh my gosh. Like, and I got so encouraged to keep going. This is around the time, again, I cut off my friend. I had cousins who were going to prison. Um, I mean, like a lot of chaos was going in my, li- like, in my life. My friends, I mean, people around me are dying. Like it was, it was chaotic that I just was like, I got to get out of New York. So like, I'm going to the military. So I went to um, Fordham to go sign up. And I, you know, I told the recruiter, look, I've been arrested. I had got arrested in Orlando for disorderly intoxication, for um, for resisting arrest, fighting cops at a club. I said, I got a record. I got arrested once. I got a bunch of speeding tickets. Um, I just was honest with him. I was like, I I smoke, I drink. Um, what do I got to do to get in? He was like, well, you got to keep coming. You got to stop smoking, stop drinking. We're going to figure out what we can do. He pulled up my rap, my rap sheet and everything. He was like, man, it's going to be almost impossible, but we're going to try to get you in. Take the ASVAB. I take the ASVAB. I got a pretty high score. I got an 81 out of 100, which qualified me for almost every job in the military. And that's when he said, okay, we can work with this. The Air Force would not accept me, but the Navy did. And he got me in. And through halfway through the process of when I'm supposed to leave on July 5th, 2012, I just backed out. It was um, a few months before I just stopped answering his calls. I stopped going. I was like, I'm not going to the military. This is whack. I'm making money now. I'm in New York City. I got all these connections. I'm, st- I'm, in, now, I'm, I'm in the streets and, and I'm bouncing at clubs. I was like, I can go to, to college at CUNY in New York and I could live a double life again and I could figure something out. And I just, I deaded him. And he, um, and he just kept pursuing me, calling me voice messages, voice messages. A week before I was supposed to go, July 5th, a week before I went, he showed up to my apartment in New York City um, in the Heights, in the hood, which nobody really goes to. He showed up knocking on my door and he was like, man, I came here. I'm like, what's wrong with you, man? Like, why'd you come? He's like, look, I just, I feel like you need to go. I'm like, look, I got an apartment. I got a lease. I got all this stuff. He's like, I'll take your lease. He literally took over my lease. Like, this is a recruiting, you know, you know, recruiting petty officer in the United States military, took over my lease. I told him I had TVs. I don't know what to do. He bought my TVs. I mean, just straight grace. Like, I just was like, what's wrong with this guy? Like, why does, like, I can't be worth that much. Like, and now that I, you know, I've been in the military, I know it wasn't quota because quota, like, it was, it was, it was his heart for me. Like, he actually felt like I needed to go. And I was like, all right, bro, I'm going to go. You came here for a reason. I'm just going to go. So I got drunk the night before I left, talked to all these girls. I invited all these girls over like, hey, I'm about to leave. You know, my friend, we just drinking all night and I didn't sleep and went to the Navy. Didn't, and that was a big awakening for me, like rude awakening. Two months in boot camp, the rebellious person I was, having drill, drill sergeants yell at you and tell you to, you know, cursing you out and telling you to do push-ups and run and you, you don't sleep at night. It was, it, was, it was hard. I made it through boot camp barely by God's grace. And then that's when I, I, I joined the fleet of the United States Navy as an air traffic controller. I did seven years in the military and I traveled the world. I went to, I lived in Greece. I mean, I was stationed in New Jersey. So I was stationed in New Jersey first. I was going to New York City, Philly and New Jersey every weekend drinking Atlantic City, um, Philadelphia, if you know if you know where Center City is, New York, um, still partying with all my friends for four years. I left there, went to Greece um, in Greece, partied some more. But in Greece is when I started like seeking something deeper, because this is when I um I, I had, had had an experience on LSD. 
my, actually my blood brother who was now saved, he came to Christ, had offered it to me and, and with, the, with the right heart, like, hey man, this will change you. This will get you. This because like everyone knew me as a reckless person. Like, man, like one day I'm this guy's gonna go to prison. I was always that guy getting away, getting away, getting away. I'm in the military selling drugs. So like in the military, it didn't stop me. I thought it was better now because I had the uniform, I had the connections. So now I could sell drugs and no one would ever think about it. So all my friends in the streets were like, man, this dude's crazy, but they trusted me because they knew who I was. I had street credibility. So now I'm moving pounds of marijuana, pounds of marijuana, like a lot through the mail. And so my brother, you know, loving me so much, you know, he thought maybe if he takes LSD, he'll change because people in new age and, and people in the, that psychedelic realm, they think that's that, that LSD or shrooms will make you a better person. All you're doing is accessing the spirit realm illegally. So I took the LSD and I had a spiritual experience. And that's when I realized how real the spirit realm really was. It scared me. It scared me so bad. Um, I got depressed again. So when I went to Greece, it's when I started really seeking God. I started um, seeking the higher power. I didn't know who he was. That's when I started crying out. Like I had this experience on LSD. I don't know what the purpose of life is. I'm, I'm always seeking something. I've had all these women. I've had, I've had all this money. I've had all this success. What do I do? And um, I started crying out to the higher power. And I was on the island of Crete in Greece. And I'll never forget it. It was like a movie scene. You see the, the moon, the mountains, the, the moon lighting up the mountains. And I'm at the beach. All my friends are in the club getting drunk. And I decided, hey, I'm going to go to the beach and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to call upon whoever the higher power is. And I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know anything. I went out there profusely crying, just screaming, who are you? What's the purpose of life? Who are you? What's the purpose of all this? I need to know when I'm screaming. And I heard a voice say, I'm going to show you now. That same voice I heard in New York when I was suicidal. And again, I freaked out. Like, did I really just hear that? What's going on? And I just stopped and I, you know, I paused and I was just meditating on it. Like, what did I just hear? Am I tripping? And when my friends came out of the club, you know, drunk, I told them and they were like, bro, you're tripping, man. You need a drink. Just get out, get over it. What's wrong with you, bro? And I'm like, maybe I'm tripping, whatever. So I left Greece. And again, when I was in Greece, before I left, I traveled all over. I went to, I went to Barcelona. I went to Paris. I went to Amsterdam. I went to Prague. I would, I was in and out of London on weekends. I would go to London on the weekends because the, the tickets out there were cheap. I went to, you know, Santorini, to Athens. I mean, so many different places in, in Europe. I traveled. I was well traveled. Germany. I went to Berlin. I went to Frankfurt. But um, all the traveling didn't fulfill me. I thought, you know, growing up that maybe if I traveled and went to these places, it'll fulfill me. But it didn't at all. Like it was, that's what made it worse. That's what made me call out to the higher power. So I left Greece and I went, I went to California. So now I'm scheming even more. Now I'm like, okay, I'm going to Cali. I know that Cali's the Mecca for marijuana. I have a bunch of friends who sell weed. Weed isn't as bad as Molly and cocaine, which I've sold in the past. And, um, and I've sold lean, I've sold pills, all that. I was like, this is actually herb and it's good for you. It's medicinal. Maybe if I do this, you know, this will be better because now I'm spiritual. Now I'm, I've had my LSD experience. I'm really reading books on philosophy. I'm doing yoga, hot hatha, vinyasa, um, ashtanga, bikram, all types of yoga and doing ohms. Now I'm on this spiritual journey after this LSD trip. And I'm like, Cali's the perfect place. And all my friends told me about a place named Humboldt, Humboldt, California, which is three hours north of the bay. And that if I, if I went there, I would find the plug. That's where all the growers are at, but it's called Murder Mountain. If you go in there, you don't come back. Most people die out there because there's no cell phone service. It's a bunch of hillbillies out there, Asian mafia, Mexican mafia. This is where all the big drug dealers in the city will hire people to go out there and grow their weed. So I was like, man, but I can go find one. And I got to Cali. And again, just in my reckless faith that I had, I still had the gift of faith back then, but I was using it for the devil. I took my money, thousands of dollars. I took my pistol in my uniform, drove from San Diego, California to Humboldt. If you guys know how far that is, it's, it's, it's pretty far. I flew to the Bay and I drove to Humboldt, and, but then I drove back from um, the Bay to San Diego. But in Humboldt, California, when I got there, I just went in faith with my rental car and two totes, big totes in the back. And I just went to this grow up. Um, they told me there's a place on Rattlesnake Road, it's called, where there's a bunch of Asians that sell this cheap weed. I mean, crazy margins of profit. I'm talking about like six, 700% margins. Like I'm not gonna get into details about how much, I don't wanna teach anybody that stuff. I don't glorify it, but 
I went out there in faith and I just brought my money. I think it was about thirty to fifty thousand that I had I had acquired through, you know, just little little drug deals just to, to get to that point. I saw the Asians, I saw I saw the grow operation, I saw how it was fenced off, I saw how they had the pickup trucks going in and out. I saw like there were there was the Asian mafia and I just stood, I got out the car and I stood in front of my truck and I just started waving my money. So cars were passing by and they're just staring at me like they wanted to kill me. And I was just like, I, I, I'm just gonna, it's either gonna be a shootout or I'm gonna get this weed. And one couple stopped. It was an old couple, Asian couple. And they said, what are you doing? Come here, come here, come here. And I told them, I was like, I need weed and here's my money. And they were like, you're crazy, you're crazy. All right, come on. And they brought me in and um, this is not a lie at all. This is the truth. I literally got sat down, they got me a chair. And I seen all these Asians and they were cutting the weed, trimming the weed, growing it, all that. And they just brought a whole bunch of bags. They dug up from the ground bags. They had buried old weed from last year, which was still really good at the time and new weed, all this stuff. And I got the craziest prices. I mean, I hit the jackpot. Hmm. So now I'm like, it's over. Like I'm the plug. I don't have no more middlemen. Like I'm the man, I'm the supplier now. And I told all my friends, people that I used to buy from are now buying from me. Now I'm, I'm fronting, no problem. I had, I create a, a whole demonic drug operation apostolic, like apostolically for the devil was built. And now I had, um, I started creating drug, drug holes around the US. So I was putting people on that never sold drugs. I was teaching them, my friends, my, even my family, you know, people I love that I'm not, were involved. I'm not going to mention, but because some people that I love that are, are still involved. I was deep in it and um, I started making a lot of money. I was making over a hundred grand a month at this point. Um, this is when I started investing deeper in, in cryptocurrency. This is when it got crazy because now I had the traveling, the woman, you know, and, and I had money before, but now it was real money. Now we're talking about money that I've never touched. I bought two properties. I had one rented out. I had a condo on the hill of La, in, La, in La Mesa near SDSU in um, California that I bought. Now I got my seller's license so I can go and get cars at the auction to, to launder money. Um, you see, like I was I was moving smart with it, but um, I was depressed again. I was really down because I'm like, man, all this money now, now the money's not answering it either mm. because I'm making all this money, but now I'm more stressed. Now I'm paranoid thinking about the feds running in because I'm still in the military. I got to get out the military before I get caught. I'm just like freaking out. I'm thinking my friends are against me. And this is where it got real because I moved all my marijuana through the mail, everything. And this is when it got real. A package went missing. It was a package for about $20,000. At that time, it meant nothing. I mean, that was nothing. I was making so much money. But because of my pride, I just was like, I need to figure this out. And it was around the 4th of July of uh, 2019. And this is when I was like, okay, I got to figure this out. Like, who, who stole my package? And I was so reckless because the girl I was dating at the time, and I had many girls, but the one I liked the most... She was like, just let it go, let it go, don't worry about it, it could be the feds. And I was like, no, I've been 100% in the mail, I got this on lock, I got this whole system, it has to be somebody inside. Because I knew about the dark web, I knew how the dark web works, I, I've been on the dark web, I've seen things, I've even bought stuff, bought stuff off the dark web, and I know people, they go on the dark web to, to, to infiltrate within. And this is when I um started, I, I wanted to find out so bad, I asked the girl I was dating, hey, you talked to me about voodoo in the past and witchcraft, can the person you know that does witchcraft, the voodoo priest, help me figure this out? If this is real, like y'all say, because they are, people always say they're so real, I'm like, then, then he'll, he should tell me how much it costs. She was like, you're crazy, but all right, I'll give him a call. And she said, okay, well, um, let me call let me call my cousin. Her cousin's a voodoo priest in Haiti. I was like, all right, call him. And he said on the phone in Creole to her, he has to come to Haiti if he wants any answers. And she thought, that's it. Like, he's not going to go. You know, this guy's not going to go. And in Haiti, they call um, Americans or someone that's not Haitian a blanc, which means like a gringo in Spanish. And I just, I was like, all right, let's go. So we bought the ticket. She thought I was crazy. She tried to get me to back out. I was like, nah, we're going. And bring your parents too. Tell them to come. We went. We went to Haiti. We went to, um, flew into Port-au-Prince. It is a third world country. It is ex very bad extremely ghetto. I did not think it was like that because I traveled in Europe and I went to some poor places, but that is by far the mo the poorest place I've ever been. And when I flew into Jacques Mel, we had to, we, I mean, to, to Port-au-Prince, when I flew into Port-au-Prince, we had to drive all the way to Jacques Mel. If you know where that's at, it's about three hours away. Jacques Mel is one of the most known areas for voodoo. I went out there to see the voodoo priest. And um, when I went out there, I paid him the money. He started reading my cards. He started, he started doing all these crazy rituals, putting on an outfit, chugging alcohol, smoking a cigar, summoning demons into his body. I didn't know they were demons. They call them ancestral spirits. So I'm watching all this. I'm seeing the tarot cards and he's reading things about my past spot on. I mean, like things that really happened that nobody could have just known. 
So at that point, it's like it's like I started believing because of the truth. He was telling me true things that happened. But if you know about witchcraft, the devil knows your past, but he can't know the future. Only God does. Mm. But I didn't know this. So I'm listening like, man, what? Like, I, okay. And I'm, I start asking questions and engaging. And he's telling me things. And, you know, the demon's speaking through his body. Like before he, the, before he does anything, he has to drink, smoke, and do a ritual and dance so the demon will possess him. And you'll see his face, everything, his facial, uh, facial expressions, everything changes. And the spirit will speak through him. And I'm just looking at this guy like, okay, um, what else? And he's telling me things. And I'm like, who stole my package? He's like, I'm going to tell you, but first you got to do this and we got to do this and you need to go get this and all these supplies and we have to go to another hut. They had these red huts. It was on a property. It was so demonic. I'm talking about human skulls in the hut, animals that they would sacrifice just roaming around, like a whole altar. Like I'm talking about like voodoo dolls, like the whole nine, disgusting. I'm talking about like gruesome. I'm in, I'm in their real tents, but I'm just watching him do his stuff and he's writing on a piece of paper and they're doing a whole bunch of rituals. He told me when you get back to Florida or to California, when you get back, you're going to find out. And I was like, okay, well, all right, I guess that's it. After seeing all that for about three days of seeing all the voodoo and everything in Haiti. And by the way, Haiti is a beautiful country. The food's amazing. Um, it's not Haiti that's the issue. It's the witchcraft in Haiti. If you guys study the history of Haiti, they, they did a voodoo ritual to get, um, to get their independence. It's actually known in Haiti, um, which is sad. There's a demonic altar set up out, out there. It's crazy. But um. I left Haiti and I still have, I still was doubtful. I'm like, I don't know, man. Like, I don't think no one's going to just snitch on themselves. Like, uh, I don't know. And that's when everything began. So my friends started distancing themselves from me. People would say certain things real quick and regret saying it. And I'm like, wait, did my friends rob me? And I'm starting to think everyone that was closest to me, my blood brother, my best friends, I'm talking about people I love were all against me. Again, like ha what happened in New York that same thing was happening, but this time it's worse because now I have money, now I have power, now I have weapons, now I know people, now, you know what I'm saying? So like now I, I went down this crazy path and I was like, well, I'm going to keep seeking spiritualists. I went to an um, Indian medium in, in San Diego who told me a bunch of true things as well. But what they do in voodoo and witchcraft is they'll tell you true things about your past, spot on, and then lie to you. They'll tell you, oh, this person's against you and you need to give me this amount of money in order for it to break. But what you're doing is you're coming in agreement and you're actually putting witchcraft on someone who probably didn't do anything to you. Mm. But I didn't know this. So I'm going to the mediums. I'm going to the psychics. I'm going to more voodoo priests. I'm going to, to witches. I'm, I'm all in. Now I'm just, I don't care about the package. I don't care about the money. Now what I care about is finding out like what's true because I'm like, this stuff is real. Like they're telling me true things. Like, what if this is what I'm called to do myself? Because they're telling me things like, "Hey, and you're you're called to be a warlock. You're called to be a you're called to be a dual inducted warlock. And this is your ancestors. And and and, and your great grandmother was a witch. And, and they tell you all these things just to like to get you to believe this because they want the devil wants to use you, right. especially when he sees the gifts on your life and the call on your life. The demons know before even we do because they can see in the spirit realm. So, anyways, I'm I'm seeking I'm seeking. I went to New Orleans and this is when it got even realer. I went to a, a warlock out there in New Orleans and he was training me up because I met him he said you know he said the same things that all the other ones said and said I need to train you I'm the one that's called to train you a Puerto Rican guy and I literally as he's saying these things and I'm learning from him different things Solange Knowles walks in Beyonce's sister into that little it's called the Botanica the little witchcraft store Solange Knowles Beyonce's sister walks in with her boyfriend and I'm like Am I, is this a dream? And I'm, is this Solange knows? He's like, yeah, she comes here regularly. We do rituals for her and her family. And I'm just like, what? Like the nose? He's like, yeah, man, this is real. And she's buying product and, and paying for rituals. And I'm like, this might be my call. This, this might be my purpose. This might be it. Because again, I'm seeking the purpose of life. That's the root to all this is the, what's the purpose of life? So as I'm, I'm, I'm learning all these things, I'm like, okay, well, I'm going to Haiti and I'm going to Puerto Rico. They told me I had to go to a cemetery and I had to be in, in a cemetery for two weeks in each island. And I had to like literally do dances and rituals. And, and they said they were going to like literally torture you, like whip you. And you got to go through the process in order to become a warlock. And I was like, all right, well, this is what I'm supposed to do. Now, this is when God started moving. Because as I agreed to do this, I was supposed to leave in October. And how old were you at this time, Richard, when you started to really go deep into this stuff? I was 29 years old, 29 oh. years old. So, yep, 2019, and it was a very fast process. And um, also, not, not only did I study witchcraft, I was studying Islam, 
because I was studying all these religions. Mm -hmm. Because all these 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 demons that would speak to them, would speak through them, would speak about different religions like Buddhism. They would always glorify Buddhism, Islam, but they would never glorify Christianity. Mm. But I, I didn't think about that because if you if you know about Buddhism, they talk about a Christ conscious, and Islam that they say Jesus is a prophet. So it's like. I didn't put two and two together until time started going by because I didn't feel fulfilled. I didn't, I didn't feel like it was it. So now I'm like, okay, well, I need to get more supplies. I'm going to stores buying crystals, not the little crystals on the neck that people have, the big crystals, the thousands of dollars worth of crystals. Like I had them all in my apartment. I had an altar with statues. I was wearing about five to six different bees, which represented different ancestral spirits, demons with different colors. I mean, I had sage, all types of sage, Florida water. I was taking ritual baths, like with herbs and different things and doing rituals. And I was doing these things for protection on my home, thinking that my friends were against me because they were telling me that. And I, But really what I was doing was was actually welcoming, welcoming, welcoming in demons. I was welcoming them. I was welcoming them. Welcoming them whatever, I'm done. All right. I would let them in. Through the witchcraft and um and, and now was this was this all part of the the warlock training? Yes, this is the, all the stuff they would tell me to get. Every time I would see them, they would say, "Buy this and buy this. Put this in your home. Do this ritual." They, I mean, they had like I'm talking about the whole sheet with the step by step instructions. They had uh -huh. an instructional guide. Mm -hmm. They would tell me to do this at night and do this. They would say, you know, get a pineapple and 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 get 55 cents and or whatever the cents was and go put it at an intersection. And when you drive by, don't look back or, or, or else this will happen to you. And I was doing these things thinking I was protecting myself and, and being trained up and getting prepared. I was going through like preparation for boot camp and the cemeteries, right? And um, I'm doing these things, but life's, life is getting worse. So the girl that I was dating, right? The one that introduced me, she was with me this entire time. We left California. We moved to Jupiter Beach because she got pregnant with my first child. And I, I figured, you know what, let's be close to family in Fort Lauderdale. That'd be better, but not too close. So we moved to West Palm area, Palm Beach area in Jupiter Beach. And that's when, um, you know, she was going through it. I was putting her through so much. I would, I would say like, she's probably doing witchcraft on me. I would accuse her. I would like be like, man, you don't know this. You don't know that. And, and she was going through so much. She almost left me so many times, but by the grace of God, she would stay with me. She would stay with me. I, would, I was putting her through so much. And she was just fed up with it. She was just like, just stop. You're always looking for something new. Like, just stop. Just give up. And she was just so like, just like going, like in chaos. She's pregnant with her first child too. And, mm. you know, she's going through it. As I'm seeking and seeking and seeking, I kept saying to the higher power, I was like, show me more. Show me more. Show me more. I thought I was on the right path. I thought that this was the higher power wanting me to do these things. And I show me more. Show me more. And eventually the father, the Bible says the father no one comes to the sun unless the father draws him in. Right. So this is when he was like, it's time. Now I started encountering Christians. So my first encounter was in a liquor store on Halloween. I was in the liquor store and I was trying to start a business, a wine bar with these Indians. I was um, just proposing the idea. We, were, we had been meeting every day and um, a guy walked in and his name was Richard. That's my name, right? White guy in his 40s just walked in. We're, at, we're near PGA. It's a really rich area. And he just was like, you got a light on you. You got a light on you. And I'm like, what? He's like, you're like an angel. He's like, look, man, I just got saved. Jesus saved me. And and I just want to invite you to my house. And I'm like, bro, what is wrong with this guy? But I'm thinking in my mind, okay, we're in PGA, all multimillionaires. And I'm like, business opportunity. Okay. I was like, sure, it's Halloween. He, he was coming to get alcohol again. New baby Christian. So he didn't really know better. And by the way, he's on fire still to this day. But um, he invited me to his house, multi-million dollar house. I'm talking about at least 10 million on the water. He got boats and all that stuff. And I went with my girlfriend and I'm like, all right, let's go see what's going on. All right. And we walk in there and there's all these, you know, prestige people, lawyers, doctors, you know, politicians, um, you know, police, whatever. They just stayed focused on us. They were like kind of ignoring the party. They, and this is their party. This is their house. And they're just like, we just, we love you so much. And this guy would just keep crying. And I'm like, what's wrong with this guy? Why does he keep crying? And they were just too nice. And I'm, I'm trying to ask him about his business with real estate because he had a very successful real estate company. And he just keeps like deflecting it. Like, don't worry about that. Like, like man, let's talk about the Bible. And I'm just like, bro. I looked at my, my girl at the time and I'm like, they got to be swingers. Like, this is weird. We got to go. And there, she was like, yeah, there's that, that's the only thing I could think of too. Like, they're probably swingers. They're too nice to us. So we left and I was like, forget this. This guy would not stop texting me. He would text me almost every day. Come to my church. Come to my church. Come to And I would just be like, man, forget this guy, man. I would just ignore his texts. 
And also the next, so the next encounter um, was a barber. So I had to get a new barber. I'm in a new city, and um, I, it was recommended to me, recommended to me through somebody to go to this barber named Paul. Right? Go figure. So I go to this barber shop, and he's giving me a cut first time, and he's playing Christian rap. Right? And I'm like, man, what is this? He's like, it's Christian rap. Oh, okay. You ever heard about Nipsey Hustle? And he's like, yeah, I heard about him, man, but I don't listen to that crap. Like, I, it's, it's whack to me. And I'm like, what? Nipsey? Nipsey, come on, man. He's 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 deep, man. Like he's he, he like he's woke. He's like, man, nah. I listen to, I listen to G Christian music, man. I'm gonna um, I love Jesus and and I listen to Christian rap. And I was trying to convince him the entire time, trying to convince him that it's not Christianity. I was telling him about the voodoo I was doing, like what I believed in, and all this. And he just stayed strong on his faith. And he would just always be like, nah, man. It's Jesus. Hmm. Nah, man. It's, and I'd be like, come on, put on some nip. He'd be like, nah. He was actually getting kind of frustrated, but he stayed patient in the spirit, cut my hair up, showed me so much love. I blessed him. And I just was like, man, this, you know, this older black guy, you know, who looked hip, he had the clothes, like he, he didn't look like the average Christian, was so strong in his faith. And I was like, okay, that's, a, that's just a coincidence. Like, it, 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 that's whatever. Okay. So I'm at home and um, at this time I was learning chakra balancing. I actually was being trained up by a shaman um, at a crystal shop. Um, they were having workshops, a, a, a famous shaman from Brazil. And I was going um, every day learning about chakra balancing. I was actually balancing chakras over people. And um, I was and at this, home. This, this was different from the warlock training. Was, was yes. this just something that you were additionally interested in? I was in? additionally interested. I kept seeking. I kept seeking. Yeah. I was like, I want to learn more. I was yeah. preparing for when I went to Haiti and when I went to Puerto Rico. I was just always trying to learn more. It was from a crystal shop that I had shopped at. They had a, a, a conf, uh, they had a seminar type of thing where he came and he taught people how to do um, chakra balancing. I paid the money. I forgot what, how much it was, like five, six hundred. I paid it. He was teaching me all this. I mean, breath work. This is when I learned about breath work, which is extremely demonic. I was learning about breath work, how to, like, you do a whole bunch of breath exercises and then it's supposed to help you get freed from or whatever. But it's honestly just demons. They're just manifesting. You never see people get delivered. And I was learning breath work, chakra balancing. Um, this is where I was learning more about sage, Indian, more of the Cherokee Indian and Syrian Indian practices, which is shamanism. And he was talking to me. And it's like every warlock in which I went to always said, like, you're supposed to be trained under me. They were all trying to put me under their covering. And um, this is when it got real because um, when I went home, I was on YouTube looking up um, chakra balancing, some more just learning. I saw a video that said Reiki healer delivered from demons. And I'm just like, what? A Reiki healer, which is pretty much like similar to chakra balancing, got delivered from demons. I'm like, what? And I just clicked on the video and it was a video from... Um, the last reformation with uh, Torben Sandergaard was a powerful man of God. He's actually locked up right now for the uh, for you know wrongfully, but kind of like Paul in the Bible. I saw the video and he was casting demons out of a witch. And this lady's testifying on video saying, "I got delivered. I was a Reiki healer for doing you know chakra balancing, sage, all that stuff, crystals for over ten years." And she was just like, "And I got delivered from demons. I got baptized." Torben took her to the streets and she was evangelizing the day she was saved praying for people they were getting healed and i'm just like what is this christians have power and i called my girl like come here look at this do you see this what like this can't be real no way and again i'm still seeking it was like i, I kept wanting more and most people in new age and witchcraft are the same way you never see them stop they never come to this conclusion they're always looking for something different right. because they're not fulfilled they don't know the, they don't know their purpose they don't have christ they're not filled with the holy spirit so they had a map, a road map on there, and I hit up somebody on the road map that was in West Palm Beach area. This little um, young, not, not not young, small, small white lady named um, Sharon, and she just was so spirit filled. I was telling her everything I was doing, and she was just like, "It's Jesus. Like, I'm just letting you know there is power in Christ. Like, you can cast out demons, you can heal the sick, you can speak in tongues, which is you know Mark 16 talks about that." And I'm just like, "What is this lady talking about? And why does she keep praying for me? And when she prays for me?" Why do I keep feeling something? I kept feeling something. And I'm like, what is this? And as she would pray for me on the phone, on speaker, I would literally see shadows in my house moving. So I was, uh, this is when it got real. I'm like, wait, hold up. Is it Christianity? No way. It can't be because I was raised Catholic. So my whole perception or my perspective on Christianity, on Jesus was the Catholic church. And I was like, no, 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 this can't be true. And she was telling me, you can't fornicate with your girl. You can't be in fornication. You're, 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 it's wrong. You gotta, you, you can't do this. And I'm like, this lady saying I can't sleep with women. I, I gotta wait till I'm married to have sex. This is crazy. But, but, I, but, but there's power. So, the guy Richard kept texting me, like I said, and I was like, all right, I'm gonna go to this guy's church. 
if Christianity is real, I'm going to go. And he was um, part of a, a powerful church out in um, West Palm. It's more of like a worship family church. And I went out there and um, when I walked in, I just felt the atmosphere. And this guy was so excited. When I came, he was there early, like, you're here, you finally made it. All right, come on, come on, come with me. We're gonna get front row seats. I'm a, and I'm just like, man, come on, bro. Like, and I'm in bed, I'm like putting my head down, like, okay, where am I at? Like, okay, I've never been in a Christian church. This doesn't look like the Catholic church. And I'm walking in with my girl and we sit in the front and I look up on the stage and guess who's, who's the lead worshiper playing the guitar? Paul from the barbershop. And I'm like, Richard, do you know that guy? He's like, nah, he's our lead worshiper. I don't know him though. What? What? And I'm like, that's the, no, no way. And I'm like, I'm just like freaked out at this point. Like, like what are the chances? It's super coincidental. No way. And they played Reckless Love. I got wrecked. That's the first time I felt the presence of God is when they, they played Reckless Love, how he leaves the 99 for the one. Because as they were singing it, I felt the presence of God as they were worshiping. And I looked over at Richard and he just pointed at me and said, that's you. You're the one. And I was just, I fell down. I'm crying. The pastors actually came over. They laid hands on me and they prayed for me. And I'm crying. And that was like my first encounter that led me to start really seeking Jesus. And I'm like, okay. So I call up the lady Sharon. I'm like, Sharon, what do I do? She's like, get a Bible. So I order a Bible on Amazon. It comes in. And I'm like, all right, I'm going to read this Bible. It's midweek, like a Tuesday, Wednesday. I got the, it came in through Amazon. I was like, all right, I'm going to, my, 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 my girl's at work. I'm going to go by the lake in our neighborhood, beautiful little pond area, and I'm just going to read the Bible for the first time. And I go out there. As I'm about to open the Bible for the first time, a guy walking his dog just stops and says, hey, what's that? I'm like, it's a Bible. You see, it's a Bible. He's like, oh, okay, cool. He sits down. He's like, well, I'm a pastor and I, I, I do Bible studies. I'm like, oh my, it just didn't stop. I'm like, okay, well... Why? Like in my head, I'm like, why is this guy stopping and why does he care so much? All right. And I'm just like, so what do I do? He's like, okay, started in the book of Romans and he's teaching me things. And I'm telling him about the voodoo. I'm telling him about the witchcraft. I'm telling him about my altars. And he was like, get rid of that stuff, man. And I'm like, what do I do? Like, how do I fight those demons though? They're going to try to come back and get me. Like, like that, that's what happens. Like you got to keep doing rituals and sage to keep them out. He's like, no, it's just the name of Jesus. I'm like, the name of Jesus, what? He's like, yeah, just go in your house or your apartment and just say Jesus, Jesus' name is strong. And I'm like, this guy is crazy, but he's so confident. Like, all right. He said, start in the book of Romans. And he gave me his number. And I went back to my house or my apartment, I'm sorry. And I started reading the book of Romans. And I just remember saying, Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. And I literally was seeing shadows. And it kept scaring me into like a, like, uh, like, okay, I got to seek this, this higher power. And I'm reading the book of Romans and it convicted me. It convicted me so much that it was, it was unbearable. And halfway through the book of Romans, I'll never forget it. December 1st, 2019, halfway through the book of Romans, I finally came to the revelation that Jesus Christ is the highest power. Like he's Lord, right? Lord means master. If you look it up the, um, in the Greek, it means master. So I was like, he's the highest power. That's what, it, that's what it essentially means, is that he's the Lord. He's the highest power. Hosanna in the highest. So I was just like, it's Jesus. He's, he's, it's Jesus. And when I said it out of my mouth, and I really believed it in my heart, and I didn't say it like Romans 10, 9 exactly. I said it with the intention in my heart that he's really the highest power, and I meant it. I got encountered by Jesus in my apartment. All I remember is a light came <laughs> And I got knocked to the ground. That same light that helped me out with the sleep paralysis. That same voice that helped me out in New York when I was going to commit suicide. That same voice that told me I'm going to show you now in Greece. Knocked me down to the ground. He didn't say anything this time. And, and Richard, this time, was this similar to the dream that you had? Or was this in real life, real this time? This is in real life. I wasn't in a trance. I wasn't in a vision. This is like in the physical. I got literally knocked down to the ground. Like it was, it was like the light was so... It was too strong. Like I just, I couldn't, like I just got, I got, I curled up in a ball and I was shaking and I was manifesting demons. I was crying profusely, coughing up. <clears throat> like just, I felt like things were coming out of me. And then as things started coming out of me, I began to speak in a dialect, like in tongues. And I'm like, why am I doing this? But it felt so like from my belly, I felt like I had to do it. And it felt like, like liberating in a way. And I'm speaking in tongues. And I just got, and I stopped. And this is like 20 minutes later. And that's like, I came back to reality. Like, I'm just like, and I felt the most overwhelming peace that I've never had. It was finally, it came, the purpose of life. It came, everything I was looking for. It was like, 
it just, that's it. It wasn't knowledge. It was my, my spirit and my soul. I just knew it's Jesus. And I just was like, it's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. It's Jesus. And I just can't, I couldn't stop saying it's Jesus. I had the power of the Holy Spirit in me, his love in me, his peace in me, his joy, everything in me. Like now I had fulfillment. I felt fulfilled. I called up Sharon. I told her what happened. She's saying, hallelujah, praise God. She's praying more. I'm like, and I'm like, okay, now I got to get rid of everything. Like now it's time. Like I got to get rid of all my altars. I got to get rid of all my crystals. I had Egyptian crosses. I mean, the, I had like all types of stuff. Like it was pure gold. And I was like, I don't care. I'm not pawning it. I'm getting rid of everything. I was so radically encountered by Christ that I was like, everything's gone, everything. And I'm just asking questions like, is this demonic? Is this demonic? Is this demonic? And I got a big old bag and I put everything in it. And I told my girl when she came home from work, it's Jesus. She's like, what is Jesus now? I can't believe it. And I'm like, and we can't sleep in the same bed. Hmm. She's like, what? And she starts cursing me out. Like you put me through so much. Now you can't even sleep in the bed. Now I'm not your girlfriend. What are you talking about? I'm like, look, there's no girlfriend and boyfriend in Christ. Like, this is what the lady told me. Like, I can't do this. Like I got to sleep in the other room. I'll sleep on the floor. I don't care. And she's just like, what's wrong with it? She was pissed off. And she just was like, okay, whatever. Like I, she just was riding. She was like, all right. And I was like, okay. And also I'm going to the wildlife preserve behind the neighborhood and I'm going to burn all this tonight. I'm going to create a bonfire back there. She's like, it's illegal. I was like, I don't care. I'm getting rid of all this. And that night, she actually came with me. It's crazy. She came with me, and we went back there. I had my gun and a machete just in case because it's a whole bunch of wildlife, animals. Who, who knows who's back there? And I made a bonfire, and I burned everything. And we saw so many spiritual things back there. We saw, again, the, the shadows moving. We, we were feeling things. And when the, all that stuff burned, we just we turned away and never looked back. Like we we walked back to the apartment, and that's when I was like, "It's time." Like I told her, like I can't be with you and I can't marry you. I can't be unequally yoked. This woman said, named Sharon, like you have to be saved if if like we even consider marriage. And I was like, and I don't know, and I'm sorry. And she's just crying, and I'm like, I know you're seven months pregnant with our child. This is our first child, but I got to do the right thing. I was like, yo, it is Jesus for real. Like it's Jesus. And she's just crying and she was like, whatever. And she went to, you know, to her room. That night was the first time I gave up pornography. I've been watching porn my whole life. All these women, sex, all these things. Like it was a normal thing. I said, I'm done. Like I'm done. I'm not watching porn. I'm not having sex until marriage. I'm done. And that night in my bed, I'll never forget. I seen, I seen two shadows, two demons next to my bed. And now I know incubus and succubus. And they were by my bed. And I felt this overwhelming feeling of lust to watch porn or like to go sleep with some, a woman. And I said, no. And I was shaking in my bed and I just screamed upon the name of Jesus like that guy told me to do. And I got knocked out and went to sleep. I woke up and I, since that day, I have never had an urge to watch porn or be with another woman again. It was, that was it. Like I literally got delivered. Like that feeling that I used to have in my stomach, it was just gone. And since by the grace of God, from that day, I have never watched porn on my, on my walk. And I thank wow. God for that. Wow. Now, Richard, after you burn all of the witchcraft, normally what we hear in testimonies is uh, there's a retaliation that happens. A lot of the times when people do this, though, they think that, you know, well, everything is going to be fine. I'm walking with Jesus now. Everything is going to be good and dandy. <laughs> but for you specifically, as now you're walking with God, you've burned the witchcraft. Mm -hmm. What did that process look like for you? What did that retaliation look for you if there was any? Everything got heightened spiritually. That's when it really got real. So the first, um, I would say, encounter of backlash was actually with my girl, friend at the time. She, uh, about a few days later, after I gave up the porn and everything, I, I was sleeping one night in the other room and I heard her scream, ah, and I ran over really quick and she was crying, shaking, pregnant again, seven months pregnant. I just seen two demons and one of them looked exactly like you and they were trying to have sex with me. So remember what I, I said before, those two spirits were by my bed that I got delivered from. Mm -hmm. Now they were trying to attack her. Obviously, I had a soul tie with her, the fornication, all that stuff. And I just kept saying, Jesus. I would walk around and say, Jesus, 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 Jesus. I just didn't know what to do. I would just say, Jesus, Jesus, like, leave, like, Jesus, leave. Like, I would just, I didn't know, I didn't know how to pray other than just use the name of Jesus, which is still powerful. And she got scared out of her mind. That actually led her to get into the Bible and read the book of Romans. Mm -hmm. And then about a week later, she had an encounter with Christ. Wow. And that's what that's when everything again began to just heighten. So now, now that we both got saved, we needed more deliverance. We we needed discipleship. We needed a lot of we, need, we needed more fellowship. And this is when COVID hit bad. So we were dealing with a lot of demonic attacks. I'm talking about black cats showing up at our front door, 
I'm talking about like witches, like coming to our apartment, trying to speak to us. People like the, the the warlock that was training me up, calling me like consistently, me not answering the phone. It was, it got real. Like it got really real. Our family completely just at the time, we're good now. They went against us. Mm. My family didn't want me to marry her. Her family didn't want me to want her to marry me. And we're, we're talking about marriage now because now she's saved. I pretty much said like, hey, look, we got to see some fruit for at least a month. I got to make sure that you're really saved and you're not faking it. And we went to some ministries. We got some more deliverance. She she got encountered again at a at a, a ministry where they called her out. And they specifically, the, the man of God, the pastor said that she had a specific tattoo that she had, that her, she dealt with some issues in the past with her father, specific things. She got delivered um, at, at that spot some more and... I mean, I was I was learning more as well. Mm. And that's that lady Sharon was discipling us. She was showing up. She was praying for us. We were going to hit her church. But the warfare was crazy. I mean, everything was against us getting married. And I, it was so hard to the point where I, I, at one point I thought, like, I'm not going to marry her. Like, she's not the one. And I'll never forget one day in my apartment, I'm praying, you know, and I just asked, Lord, is this your will? And he said, do you have faith? And I said, yes. He said, if you have faith to do all these things that you've done in the past and even come to me, why not put your faith in marrying her? She's saved, and he started. He started going down the list. Like, what? What does she have that? What? What? What's, what qualities does she have that you wouldn't want? And I'm like, she does have everything I want. Like, mm. we relate. We're like, we're, we're we're like we're compatible. She's a powerful. Like, you know, she's she's at the time she had a she's a powerful woman. Like, she was a financial center manager at the Bank of America. Financially, she's stable. Has no other children. Same age. Like. We just related so much. And I was like, you know what? It is true. I was like, I'm going to move in faith. So I told her, look, we're going to the courthouse to get married. We tried to get married at the court, I mean, at the church that we were going to, but because of COVID, they weren't allowing people to come. Yeah. And we tried to get baptized too. And they were like, we're not doing baptisms because of, because of COVID. So I'm like, I need to get baptized. We need to get baptized and we need to get married. So that's when we went to the courthouse alone on her lunch break. I mean, we just went in faith and we just got married to abide by the governing laws of the land. You have to get married, you know, legally. You can't just go and say, I'm married, like, no. And we did that. And then Sharon um, took us to LA Fitness, the hot tub in LA Fitness, and we got baptized right wow. there. And, you know, again, I already prayed in the Holy Spirit. Um, eventually, about a month later, she got baptized in the Holy Spirit. And um, we just got lit up on fire and we joined that ministry, uh, TLR, The Last Reformation with Torben Sandergaard. Powerful ministry. It's a kickstart ministry. That's actually the name of the ministry. They kickstart people into their calling. I mean, they were in the streets teaching us how to, you know, lay hands on the sick so they could be healed, cast out demons early on. Like we thought this was normal mm. because we came to this, you know, in, in, into the, the body of Christ with this and the spiritual warfare was crazy. I mean, finances got attacked. I mean, like the, the apartment we were at, mold just busted out out of nowhere. We tried to get our money back. We're like, look, we got mold. They were like, no, they just robbed us. Two apartments, actually, back to back, robbed us of our deposit, money, all that. We had to hire the mold tester to come in and test the mold. They didn't even, they, and it was proven that there was mold. They didn't care. So we lost all that, all that money. I mean, like, I even had, got a lawyer. When I got the lawyer, the lawyer said that we could win in court. And I remember just opening up the Bible to where it talks about, you know, not suing your brother and sister in Christ, not taking them to court. Yeah. This lady wasn't a brother, or I mean, a sister in Christ, but I just felt convicted. Like, I felt like the Lord was telling me, don't do it. Yeah. I lost so much money. I, again, like almost in total, like fifteen to $20,000 got into a car accident. I, I had lost some money on that because I had to get it fixed. And now the baby's coming out soon. So um, my child was born on February 29th, 2020, leap year. He's a leap year baby um, on the news and everything. It was crazy. The only child born on leap year or the first child in that hospital born on leap year. The news was there and everything. And we, even though we got married, we're butting heads. I mean, like we love each other, but there's so much going on. And this is, again, where it got real. I was being tormented by the enemy um, with not telling her the truth about everything I did. I kept hearing the enemy say, don't tell her everything, because if you do, it could affect the child health-wise. And I felt convicted by the Lord to tell her everything in the past that I did, just confess it all. And one night, I had a dream. And in the dream, the Lord rebuked me, literally. Like, you're going to tell her everything when you, when you wake up. And I felt the fear of the Lord, like this conviction, like this reverence to God, like, okay. And I woke up. It, was, it felt like I didn't sleep for days. It was terrible. That same night, she had also had a dream, but let me just continue. So I got up I, out of the dream. I went downstairs on my on our um, on our couch and I'm waiting like, okay, where's she at? She was walking our dog. And I'm like, all right, when she comes back, 
I'm going to tell her everything. All the women that I cheated on her with, um, having girls in, in, my, in, in our apartment when she was at work. I mean, like her finding lipstick in my in my, my bends and then me blaming it on my friend, like everything. Like I was like, I got I to gotta tell her. I feel I feel it. And she comes in the, you know, the apartment like, hey, I had a dream last night. And I'm like, look, I, you can tell me that after. I just I got to tell you this. And as I'm telling her, she's looking at me with her jaw dropped like, and I'm like, I thought this, you know, this is a Haitian woman from from Harlem, New York City. Like, I thought she was going to knock me out, like swing. And she was just silent. And I'm like, like, do you not hear what I'm saying? And she was like, God took me to heaven last night. Hmm. Jesus had literally took her to heaven. She had an encounter with the father. And then Jesus literally said word for word, forgive him. He's a good man in heaven. Took her like she saw everything in detail she can tell you about how the trees look the the mansion you know how the bible says that like, he prepares a mansion for us in heaven like she said she saw the people like she saw the angels she saw everything and literally jesus took her and, and spoke to her and said forgive him he's a good man like, like god was already speaking prophetically about what was going to happen in the future like he's a good man don't worry forgive him and she was like that's why he took me to heaven and she was like oh my god i can't do this i can't be with you we're already married, like, we're about to have a kid. And I'm like, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. Like, I'm like, I was messed up. It was before we got saved. Like, I don't, and you know, we're babies in the faith. And she was just, she broke down. She didn't want to talk to me for weeks. It was bad. Like, it, she just didn't want to speak to me at all, man. Like, mm. I just waited and I prayed and I fasted and I waited on God. Mm. And eventually she said, okay, I forgive you. And it was hard that about for about a year, we went through a lot. Like I'm talking about getting freed from different things, healed from different things, just always butting heads. Like it was a lot. Um, I actually um, adopted um, her younger brother at 15 years old. His name is Kevin. He's actually our videographer now. I had talked to him, preached the gospel to him at her house one day and told him to shoot my first music video because I got a prophetic word about doing music. And now he's a full-time videographer. But mm. Yeah, we had took him in, so it was a lot of warfare with that because um, her, their father's a Freemason and their whole family does Haitian voodoo. So you just think about that type of backlash. It mm -hmm. was it was constant prayer. I had to pray all the time, fasting. I was consecrated in the Word, and it was just a lot of warfare um, in the home and outside of the home. I actually got healed from a disease that doctors couldn't heal as well. Um, I had larynx pharyngeal reflux on um, my first three-day fast, water fast. The Lord healed me of a disease I had for nine years. I had gotten four endoscopies in the military. They couldn't figure it out. They said it was just genetics. Um, I had a hiatal hernia. And that because every time I ate, my acid would come up, food would come up. I was in my early 20s taking Nexium, you know, at growing up. And um, on a three-day fast, I heard the Lord say, go in the closet and pray against that spirit of infirmity. And I prayed, and I remember coughing some stuff up. And I still didn't believe it. I barely had just enough faith. I just was like, whatever, I'm going to take a pill soon. A few weeks go by and I, I hadn't taken any pills and wow. I tested it. I was like, I want to go to the gas station and get a Red Bull. I haven't drank a Red Bull in so long. Mm. I chugged the Red Bull, nothing, I drank, drank another one. Like, just like, let's see what happens. If I would have drank any type of acidic thing, things would come up. Nothing came up and I was just like, I got healed. So God healed me of that. The warfare was wild, man. And it was just, it felt like it was, it was like 10 years in one year. Mm. It was so much going on. We were, we were growing in the faith. We were learning so quickly. The Lord was fast tracking us so quickly. Um, the people we had in our life discipling us, I thank God for them because they were very mature in the faith. They are very mature in the faith and they helped us so much just to learn the Lord, have a relationship with Him. Yeah. How's your relationship with your parents and your family today? Oh man, that's a great question. Um, that's actually where a lot of the backlash came. So when we um, we got married, you know, we didn't invite nobody because they didn't want us to get married. And then when um, and why was that? Because they they thought that I was moving too fast. They knew my parents knew that their fam her family did voodoo, and her family knew that my family knew about that and that they were judgmental. Hmm. Even though my my fa my parents at the time they weren't any better. Like they weren't in the f they they weren't saved. Yeah. So me coming to Christ, knowing this now, like now I, my eyes are open. I know like, okay, none of them are saved. It was just so much headbutting. If you know about Puerto Ricans, Puerto Ricans are like like really big on marriages and the traditional and all that stuff. So they, they just didn't like it at all. Man, and we preached the gospel to our family members and they wouldn't receive. I mean, my little brother, my only brother looked at me one day, it was New Year's Eve. And he told me after a month being saved, wait till you find out it isn't Jesus. He looked at me and said, wait till you find out it isn't Jesus. Wow. And I mean, three years later, he's now saved. So he got saved, filled with the Holy Spirit. He's actually in our church, um, serving as a leader in our church now, which is crazy. 
But um, yeah, man, the backlash with our family was crazy. Um, just me telling her, her dad like Freemasonry's wrong and her mom voodoo's wrong. Oh man, even the voodoo priest that's in her family, the warfare was crazy. Mm. I mean, getting attacked in our dreams and all that. But it taught us how to pray. Yeah. It taught us how to seek God. It taught us how to worship. Because when you're in such a place of like, I need you in desperation, Lord, I need you. He teaches you how to fight and how you fight. And the spirit is actually getting closer to the Lord. Yeah. That's how we fight because he fights our battles. Richard, uh, you basically were building an empire with drugs, right? And doing whatever you wanted to do. Very briefly, what ended up happening with all of that? Did you end up burning all of that? Did what, what happened with that side of your life? That's a great question. So I had a lot of vacuum sealers, which were like $500 each. I had a lot of pounds of weed. Yeah. I had a whole storage unit. I just literally just, I got rid of it all. I, I, just, I was just like, I'm not selling it. I'm just going to just throw it in the trash. And people owed me money. I had a Rolling 60 Crip, a literal gang leader in Atlantic City, was my friend at the time, that owed me $30,000. And I called him one day and I just told him, give it to a church. He was like, what? Like, I'm like, bro, I don't even want the money. Give it to a church. Just give it away. I don't want it. And he actually got mad. He was like, nah, I'm going to give you your money. You ain't going to like, he just couldn't understand it. And I was like, bro, you're good. I found Christ. I'm good. And he was a whole Muslim. He thought I was crazy. I'm like, just keep the money. I don't even care. I was calling up people that I had robbed in the past and telling them I want to pay him back. I called up a guy that I robbed when I was 17 years old. I'll never forget this. Actually, Colombian. And they were getting a lot of um, clothes in from Colombia, like designer, like Ed Hardy back then. It was really popular and like antique jeans and all that. And I'll never forget this. Like we had robbed his house. Like when he was at school and his mom was at work, we had went into his house, home invasion and took all the boxes of stuff they had. And I, I remember hearing back then that the police came and that they were crying in the middle of the street because they, they, they got that stuff fronted to them and they were going to owe the people money and they were messing with obviously the wrong people. Yeah. And we were so like gutter and reckless back then. We didn't care. We were, and we were wear the clothes in front of the guy. It was just so demonic. 12 years later, I called him and, and you know, his, I'm not going to say his name. Maybe he's going to watch this, but he knows who he is. I called him and I was like, hey, bro, like it's rich. And he's like, who's this? I was like, I got your number from this person, this person. I don't know if you remember me when I was 17. He was like, oh, yeah, I remember you, man. What's up? I was like, bro, I robbed your house. Me and my friends, you know, who they, he knew who they were. And he was just silent. And I'm like, how much did, how much was it? He had said about two to $3,000. I was like, okay, what's your Zell? I'm going to send you 5000 right now. And he just started weeping and crying. And he was like, bro, you don't understand. Like, I owed money for my rent or I was going to get evicted mm. like this week. And I'm just like, thank you, Jesus. And he come to find out he's a Christian. He got saved. He was in the church. And I'm like, what? Like, and we're crying together. And I was just trying to make everything right. I went to a library. I'll never forget this. I went to a library and sat there for a whole week, just typing up all my sins. I didn't know what to do at the time. I was like, I want to repent. And I want to just acknowledge it all to the Lord. I mean, like almost a 20 page paper. Hmm. I was just typing it all up, like I'm weeping in the library and all these young kids watching me like this guy's crazy, man. What's he doing? And just typing up all my sins that I could remember everything. And I remember just making a fake email at, or like there's a, just a, there's a throwaway email address and just emailing it to that, e that address and just like being dead with it. I forgot the password, forgot the email. I was like, I'm done. These are all my sins. And yeah, the spiritual warfare was crazy. The enemy was constantly trying to get us to go back. I mean, the alcohol, I was an alcoholic. I mean, I was drinking all the time and drugs. I completely gave it up. So the temptation was obviously there. The porn, I got I got delivered from the porn. The adultery, I, was, I mean, I was never, I was never faithful to one woman my whole life, even though it was fornication. So now I was going from like being a player to just one woman from alcoholic to not drinking at all, you know, from all this porn to like being sell like only with one woman. And it was, it was a big change, man, but um, it was worth it. Mm. It was worth it. Richard, who is Jesus to you? Jesus Christ is number one, my Lord and Savior. And he's my best friend. He's everything to me, like, like literally everything. Now, my only purpose for living is to glorify Christ in everything I do. That's how I feel. It's like, he's the center of it all my family, my wife, the ministry, music, business, anything I do, even this video is to glorify him because he took me out of so, so much misery, so much anger, so much depression, suicide, gave me a wife, children that I don't deserve. He's, he's allowed me to pastor other young people that I don't deserve. And I just, he's my everything. Richard, for people who are watching your testimony right now, 
and are connecting with what you are saying when it comes to uh, looking for that love, right? Looking um, for the meaning of life, just how you were looking for it in crystals and being a warlock and drugs and traveling, all of these different things. What is a word of encouragement? Could you just give a word of encouragement to those people who are watching? Ask. On the island of Crete in Greece, I asked. I didn't say, Jesus, show me who you are. I said, higher power, whoever you are, whoever they are, who are you and show up. I promise you, if you ask, just say highest power, who are you? Jesus Christ, Yeshua, will show up and he will show you because the Bible says if you ask, you, you, if you ask, you shall receive and he wishes that none would perish, that all, but all will come to repentance. He will put you down a path like he did with me if you have the, tr- the right heart. You have you be alone. Go. I tell people all this all the time when I'm evangelizing in the streets. Go alone and just say highest power, whoever you are, show up and mean it. Like mean it from deep within. I promise you, it won't be Muhammad. It won't be Buddha. It won't be Islam. It won't be. It won't be crystals. It won't be none of that. It will be no voodoo gods. It'll be Jesus Christ who shows up in your life. If you keep seeking, be real with yourself. If you know that this ain't it, you. Because I knew. I knew. You can't lie. The fulfillment that Christ will give you is undeniable, inexplainable. It's a knowing that you can't communicate to people who don't know. That's why the testimony is so important. Richard, any last words for people who are watching your testimony right now? Yes. Um, we're in a time where he's coming back soon, and I highly suggest that you seek the higher power. I, I highly suggest you seek Jesus Christ. Because there's no there's no other reason for life. We all we all live a short life. If you live till seventy, it's really short. I mean, people that I know that are in their seventies, they they talk about how fast life was. It was like the blink of an eye. You could have all the money, you could have all the cars, you could travel the world, you could have a family, you could do everything you want. And I promise you it, it means nothing. We can't take none of it with us. You gotta really ask yourself, what are you doing here? What are we doing here? What are we doing here? Like you need to be real with yourself and, and say, What are we doing here? And there is a purpose. There is a purpose, and it's to glorify Christ. He's the one who created you. He wants you to come back to him, and you can come back to him through simple faith. Faith means walking in belief and repentance. If you turn away from the world and from sin, not saying you're going to be perfect, but it's here. It's it's here, like really saying, I'm done. And you say, Jesus, I'm putting my faith in you, and you follow him, not just believe, but follow as faith. It'll be the best decision you ever made. Stay strong. Some of you are coming out of witchcraft and drug dealing and all that, and you're like, oh, I don't know if I want to do this. Just hold on tight because you're on a roller coaster. And you might be going down, but you're going to come right back up. Richard, lastly, could you just pray for people who are watching on the other side of the screen that may be connecting with what you're saying and maybe even are now open to receiving and following Jesus Christ? Amen. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pray. It's like the Bible says, Romans 10, 9, if you believe in your heart and you confess from your mouth that he's Lord and that he rose from the dead, you'll be saved, right? Lord means master. So I want you to repeat after me. I just heard the Lord say that. Repeat after me and say this. Say, Jesus, I accept you in my heart. Say, Jesus, I believe that you are Lord. Say, say Jesus, I believe you're the highest power. Say, Jesus, you rose from the dead on the third day. Remember, he died, he was buried, and he rose, and it's real. There's archaeological proof, historical proof. I'm telling you it's real. Just say it out of your mouth and believe it. And just say, Lord, I turn away from all my sin. And say, Jesus, fill my heart. Now, I'm going to pray for you, and you're going to get encountered, and you're going to get filled with the Spirit from this video right now. I pray in the name of Jesus Christ, everybody watching this right now, I pray, Lord, that you would fill them with your Spirit right now that they would know that you would encounter them right now through this video in the name of Jesus Christ. I pray, Holy Ghost, that you would fill them right now from the top of their head to the soles of their feet, their heart right now, transform their heart, turn it, turn it from stone to flesh right now in Jesus' name. Some of you are getting touched right now. You're profusely crying. You're shaking. Some of you are getting delivered and healed right now. You're going through what I went through right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, bless them. I pray that you have angels surrounding them that will minister to them, that will strengthen them like they did with Jesus. I pray, Lord, that they would be lit up right now on fire. I pray right now a breaker's anointing, that everything in their life that is not supposed to be there will break off. That, God, that you would prune them, the remnant, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen.